Life's too short to drive boring cars. The modern day vehicle is very, very expensive these days. There's three key areas that you really have to watch for. Electronics and modules, they control the heartbeat of the vehicle. Then there's the engine, which is arguably the most expensive single component within the vehicle. And then there's the transmission, which is second to the motor. Without it, the vehicle won't run and they're very expensive to replace if they go off the rails. You wanna make sure that you're not throwing your money away. So I'm definitely gonna help each and every one of you to avoid some of the worst transmissions on the market today. Let's get into it now. So the first vehicle on our list is essentially an older version of what we have behind us here, and that is an Audi A6. Now, of course, Audi's had their share of problems from the wet torque converter type transmissions and the DSG transmissions. Now, while this current generation A6 is vastly improved, let's just use this as an example and walk around and talk about an early 2000 generation A6. That's one of the most problematic cars with bad gearboxes. Let's just use this version as an example for the A6. I mean, they've always had the Quattro all-wheel drive system. Everybody enjoys that. Of course, the newer versions have LEDs, but back in the early 2000s, they, they didn't quite have the same style. They always come equipped with the great wheels like this. This one has the S-Line package. And of course, these fold-away mirrors with an LED strip. Lots of glass on top to allow the light in for all of the passengers, front and back, five-seater. And the A6 is always represented a slightly upscale, mid-level vehicle for Audi that definitely has a touch of class. I mean, this version here has LED tail lights, great exhaust tips down here at the very bottom. And of course, there's the A6. But again, specifically talking about a 2000, 2001 generation Audi A6, they've been noted as having some of the most problematic transmissions in Audi history. Now, all the touch of class and style that you find with the A6 can't overcome some of the problems that owners of 2000 generation 2001 had with their Audi A6s. There's many cases where the transmissions would slip, jerk, or even catastrophically fail. The output seal on the tranny would let go so they would leak as well. And the worst part was they typically cost anywhere from $3,500 to $5,000 just to rebuild it. If you get a new one, by the time it's installed, it could cost you upwards around six dollars or $7,000. A very expensive transmission to replace when they go off the rails. The big problem is with this is these Audis depreciate like they're going out of style. And as a result, what ends up happening is that vehicle often writes off the value of that car and you might as well just toss it in the junker if the vehicle was more than say six or seven years of age often you're faced with that big dilemma but a few other problems you could get check engine lights for the torque converter thermostats you'd have coolant leaks water pump timing belt could let go that's something that needed addressing chain housing as well as a valve cover gasket leaks and while some of these problems are related to coolant or engine oil that doesn't change the fact that you add those on top of the consistent number of transmission failures on these vehicles means that it's a vehicle that will likely drain your wallet faster than that commercial grade toilet flushing down the goods. So the next vehicle on our list with some of the worst gearboxes that you want to avoid like the plague is one of these vehicles. We've got a Dodge Charger and a Dodge Challenger. Now, while they're a ton of fun, especially in the V8 and even more so when you get the Hellcat associated or the Demon in these vehicles, they are extremely fun. 700 horsepower, huge amount of torque from that supercharged 6.2 liter V8 under the hood. What's not to love about that? I've test driven them before and they are a ball of excitement. They're a lot of fun and there's lots to enjoy about them, but unfortunately they're also very problematic. That's right, the transmissions in these vehicles are also known to fail. Sadly enough, some of it has to do with the excessive amount of torque that these engines output, but these trannies don't necessarily hold up all that well. Same with Jeeps. Same with Dodge Rams. It's a consistent thread throughout the Dodge product line. And these vehicles even look great too, so I can see why people buy them. I mean, we look at this, you've got this great wing on the back. It definitely has that classic retro muscle look. You've got the bulging fenders right there. And I love these tail lights there with the Dodge right there. And these also have a great new style of wheel on some of these newer muscle cars. How about that great fuel cap? Love it. And then you've got these great lines as you walk down the edge of the vehicle, it definitely looks muscular. Here we've got the funky hood and the wonderful headlights. Gotta like that look, especially in RT. But that's where the good ends is the performance and the style. Let's talk about some of the downfalls. First of all, the transmission, whether it's jerky, slips, or just goes kaboom! Because when you're imposing that kind of power on the tranny, as well as the rear differential and drivetrain, things start to break at times. You can also get erratic shifting from the transmission or stuck gears jamming up. But again, to make the not recommended list, it's also due to some other major failures these vehicles see too. 
I mean, they have alternator failures, cooling fan failures, they blow apart. There's lots of conversations about those on the net, as well as the cruise control and the power seats also fail from time to time. Well-known interior quality control pieces, things just stop working. I've had Dodges too, and I know these are problem areas. But it doesn't just end there. Let's check the inside. Unfortunately, the quality on the inside of these vehicles is consistent with a 1984 Hyundai Pony. It's the type of fit and finish that Tupperware would be proud of. <laughs> the, Dodge the Dodge Challenger and Charger. And so the next vehicle that I would suggest, don't let those pretty looks get a hold of you. Avoid this one, and that's the Nissan Rogue right here. Absolutely a very handsome little vehicle. Obviously, look at the latest and the greatest. We've got the awesome LED headlights, great little cutouts here in the bumpers. They absolutely look beautiful from the side as well and i love the wheel style here on these as well also look laser cut and look at even the side indentation definitely gives it sort of a beefy aggressive look there it's sort of the way it flares in and flares back out at both fender ends of course you've got soft touch and soft touch again how about a basic little mirror with an led strip and lots of glass on the roof for all the little hooligans inside the cabin there we go, the Nissan. So what's wrong with these vehicles? Well, it's not the looks, because the looks, they're as good or better than a lot of vehicles out there. It's absolutely the transmission, and it's the CVT that's tucked underneath that hood. CVTs inherently seem to be more problematic. The original design by base function seems to be like a very simplistic design. They use them on quads and ATVs. You would think they'd be simple and robust but they're not. There's too many sensors, you've got a drive belt, and there's just too much problems with the Nissan CVT transmissions. Some of those is a reduction in power due to slipping, leaking from the coolant hose that goes to the CVT, and line ruptures as well. I've also followed up on some stories where people bought the brand new vehicle literally driving home on the freeway, not more than 15, 20 miles away, and all of a sudden it crapped out a fault code because of the transmission. So they're very problematic at least, and at best, they're very boring to drive. They've also got issues, canister purge valve, problems with the fuel gauge not reading properly. Inherently, there's loud engine noises coming from under the hood. That's been a comment that a lot of people are not very satisfied with the volume of sounds, as well as that sunroof has been a problem as well, noted all over the internet that it could come off the rails or just not function properly at all. Unfortunately, as good looking as the Nissan Rogue is in the SV and all wheel drive format, this is just one for the record books because that transmission was guaranteed to let you down. And don't walk away, run away from this thing. And so the next problematic vehicles that all I can do is tell you to avoid would be the Ford Fiesta, Focus, and Fusion of different generations depending on the year starting around 2010. And right here while we have the RS model, it doesn't necessarily apply to these. I mean, they are attractive vehicles, they're a lot of fun, and they may even become a classic because of the rarity of the RS badge and the fact that they come with a really aggressive drivetrain. I mean, look at these. You've got the blue Brembo calipers there. Awesome wheels, love that style of rim. You've got a pretty standard looking mirror, slightly contoured door handles, front and back, and that RS wing just gives it that sporty rally look to it. And even down here at the back, it's a very handsome finished back end on it. And for a four cylinder engine to have big dual exhaust pipes like that and a massive splitter, this is a very impressive vehicle and likely will become a classic at some point. But it's not just about the RS model because the RS is a keeper. It's the non-RS versions of this. And the Fiesta Focus and Fusion all had power shift transmissions applied to them in different years. And the power shift was really not much more than a rough and glorified manual gearbox that had some rework to make it an automatic, essentially. The problem with that was as simple as rough shifting, jerkiness, slipping, and it actually outright kaboom failures from time to time. Sadly with that, it just got noisier and grindier, and even in some cases, it would resist the want to slow down. For owners who are trying to slow down in traffic, sometimes they find themselves, actually the car is almost fighting it before it goes for a downshift. Just not a happy transmission. You have modules that control the transmission, also failure modes for that so whether it's electronic mechanical or a combination of the dry clutch system was really not a great design by any stretch of the imagination the power shift transmission in the Fords and the next vehicle is one that I've never loved and it's the Grand Voyager Grand Caravan and any variation town and country or thereabouts and beyond these are absolutely horrifying vehicles never been a fan they're about as virile as a denutted cow 
There you go, and we're talking about the minivan right there. Sure, they're practical. A lot of people like them because you can shovel all the little kidlets in there. You got lots of room. They're, they're low rider. They're easy to get in and out. So I understand why people like them, but there's no fun in driving that. But it's not just about the fun. It's about some of the problems. Transmissions are huge problems with these vehicles. Devastating problems. I know personally I have a couple people that have owned these and the trannies not only failed and stopped working, they literally blew a hole in the bottom and all the oil came out. So the transmissions are brutal in these things. Not a great design, not well made. If they're not slipping, juddering, and causing you all kinds of grief, or they're blowing a hole in the bottom, then count yourself lucky because that's one of the rare moments in time where these don't fail. But it's not only that, it's the loose front end that these vehicles develop very, very soon. They have sort of wallowy, awkward handling. I mean, the interior is okay. If Tupperware signed off on it, it must be fine. As well, circling around, you've got rims on here. They're trying to make it cool, but at the end of the day, there's not much cool going on with a minivan. Now you've got this vertical hatch system here. Sure, it's practical. You can load a bunch of plywood in the back, throw a bunch of drywall on top, and a bunch of other garbage and whatnot and what have you. They're very practical and easy to live with, but that's only if they're not blowing transmissions or getting wallowy and chunky on the roads, or they're not blowing smoke out the back because they're also known for heavy oil consumption, a lot of these minivans. A lot of the V6 engines, the 3.3s, they were oil smokers. A lot of these, as soon as you get a few miles on them, you're seeing smoke billow out the back. So at the end of the day, if you have to have a minivan, maybe look at the Honda and Toyota. I think they own the market. Now, well, lo and behold, here's the next junk you want to avoid like the plague because it's another great Dodge Jeep product and that pretty much implies transmission issues. And we're talking about the Jeep Patriot right here. There's three words that apply to this. Junk, junk, and junk. That's right. These aren't that well made to begin with. Anytime one of these brands puts together a smaller shrunken down version of their mainstream vehicles, you know they're not putting all their heart, soul, and effort into that vehicle. And this definitely applies here. We definitely know that they can rust. We can see that already. Now sure they got aluminum wheels and they're kind of boxy. They have sort of a small Cherokee, old school Cherokee look to them. Very utilitarian. I mean, they do have a sunroof, which is kind of cute. They have pretty boring looking mirrors. But they do have the Jeep front end on them, which definitely gives them that signature look. And they got rails on top there to haul a bunch of junk around if you need. But they've got an interior that's almost as good as a Lada Neva. So what's the problem with these vehicles other than they're known for a vast amount of transmission failures? I mean, that's almost goes without saying with a lot of the Dodges and Jeeps, and this one doesn't disappoint. But there's also issues with quality of drive. This thing's wallowy, it drives down the road, bashing down the road, and it feels like it's strained. The engine feels a little overworked, strained, and it just doesn't have that smooth texture that you get from some of the more refined vehicles. Even though it is a Jeep, it should feel better than it does. So it's got sort of a dodgy ride quality, and NHTSA actually suggests that this is a very problematic vehicle all the way around and should be avoided at virtually all costs. Not recommended under any circumstances. So besides the issues with the CVT transmission, in these vehicles there's lots of other issues AC makes lots of noise clunky and fails as well as we're talking about water leaks front as well as back of the sunroof actually can let water in there that's a problem as well the wireless control module will also prevent a start in some cases that seems to be electrical gremlin with these also overheating engine because of ports getting plugged and clogged. And of course, then they just starts to overheat. If you cook the heads, then they're done. PCM software updates frequently needed. Vibration and shimming with the brakes when you're applying light to moderate braking power, as well as the struts or shocks prematurely leaking and of course starts to get that bobbing sensation. There really isn't an area that is untouched. Engine problems, overheating, trannies, electrical issues, suspension, brakes, you name it. It's a triple threat, the Jeep Patriot. And with all of that said, I'm sure you'd love to check out this video, some of the worst engines on the market today. Hope to catch you on the next one. See you real soon. Bye-bye.